Good afternoon. I am Andrea Chisholm with the Midday News. Special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. A reminder as well that you can download our OneSpot Media app in the Google Play Store or the App Store. That's the number one, followed by the words Spot and Media. Following yesterday's resignation of the Board of the Firearm Licensing Authority, FLA, Opposition spokesman on national security Peter Bunting is calling for the Office of the Contractor General to supervise all investigations now in progress at the entity. Mr. Bunting says given developments at the FLA, there is need for a thorough probe. The FLA has been at the center of controversy following reports that the entity guaranteed firearm licenses to individuals of questionable character. A probe is now being conducted by MOCA. However, Mr. Bunting is insisting on an independent investigation. The contractor general can do a, a, a wider investigation if there is any, any findings that, that have a criminal implication, then they can cooperate with MOCA on, in, on those files. Um, but I really believe that given that this is all happening within the Ministry of National Security, and Mr. Bunting made recommendations for the FLA to operate free of a political influence. We have to look again at the law and how the board is appointed and perhaps look at a method more you know, similar to how the, the Electoral Commission, for example, is appointed so to get that independence or to get that buffer from the, the partisan political direction. The East Kingston Police are probing an incident in which armed thugs invaded the Oliver Road Community Centre yesterday, leaving one man dead and residents living in fear. The dead man has been identified as Angel Henry. He was reportedly found dead in a churchyard. Reports indicate that the gunmen carrying high-powered weapons kicked off doors to homes, stealing appliances and other valuables from residents. They shot up vehicles and homes during the invasion. Close to 300 spent shells were recovered from the scene by the police. Crime Chief for the Division, DSP Christopher Brown, said the police and military are now keeping a close watch on the community. The incident is in relation to a gang conflict. Family members and friends of 31-year-old Kristen Pearson, who was killed by the police in May, protested yesterday. Pearson, otherwise called Instagram boss from Charlestown, St. Mary, was shot and killed at a dance in Port Maria. They say it's been four months and they have not been updated on the progress of police investigations. It's alleged that Mr. Pearson and a police officer had a dispute over a woman. The officer then pulled his gun and shot Mr. Pearson twice in his hip and stomach. I buried my son and I need justice for him. What it's here in a park now. And it's reaching me. Bad, 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 bad. They shot him without a knife. It wasn't a shootout. Nothing ever happened like that. And if it, was me, if it was me as a civilian, as an as a individual citizen, yeah. Shoot a police or if we shoot somebody else, we guarantee say we would have dead already. Long time. Or we would have dead in prison. Or gone from the wanted list. Senior Superintendent of Police Michael Smith from Area 2 says investigations are ongoing. He added that they spoke to Indicom and they were told that the file was completed. He said the only thing remaining is for the officer in question to be arrested. He said that officer killed, by, killed Mr. Pearson and he is now on the run. We have not seen him and we would have made several checks at the place that he resides and um, location that he visited and we are, we are not able to find him. So it's ongoing check, ongoing investigations. More than 600 calls were received yesterday on day one of the three-month traffic ticket amnesty. Scores of persons also visited the Traffic and Highway Division to make queries. Head of the division, Senior Superintendent Calvin Allen, says there has been positive feedback from members of the public. Over 650 calls have been uh, received in the Amnesty Call Center, and, and that interaction, I understand, went very well as out of the discussions we have with the customer service reps. 
and over 170 persons uh, visited the traffic headquarters physically. Most of that number was to collect their printout in order to go and, uh, and, and pay. Data show that outstanding traffic tickets in the courts totaled $2.2 billion. In the meantime, the number of persons who died in motor vehicle crashes since the start of the year has increased to 205. According to the Transport Ministry, this is a 12% decrease from the 233 during the corresponding period last year. Portfolio Minister Mike Henry says while the decline is encouraging, far too many people are dying in crashes. Statistics from the Road Safety Unit revealed that 39 of the 205 road fatalities occurred on a Friday. Mr. Henry says the police will have to pay special attention to Westmoreland, St. Anne, Clarendon, Hanover, St. James and St. Catherine. These are the areas that account for the highest number of fatalities since January 1. The 19 to 34 age group accounted for the most fatalities. A senior citizen died yesterday after she was mowed down on the Santa Cruz main road in St. Elizabeth. She has been identified as retired nurse Elta Sawyers. Ms. Sawyers, who resided in Postdam St. Elizabeth, was said to be in her 70s. It's reported that the driver of a car swerved to avoid colliding with another vehicle when she was hit. She was taken to the Black River Hospital where she died about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Postdam resident Peter Morris said for years, Ms. Sawyer served as a midwife delivering many children in the community. If you ask me, she is the mother of that community. All right? She, um, she delivered most babies in that community. Um, from the 50s coming up. Uh, she delivered me. My mother has eight of us, and seven of the eight she delivered us, you know? Uh, so you understand what I'm talking about. Majority of persons within my age group and a little bit older, she del delivered all of us. Investigations into the mishap are ongoing. Chief Executive Officer of the Private Sector Organization of Jamaica, Dennis Chung, says in order for Jamaica to improve customer service in the public sector, the government must fix the working conditions for civil servants. He was speaking recently at the Public Sector Transformation Unit Visionary Session for Customer Service. Mr. Chung said by improving customer service, Jamaica will see a significant improvement in economic activity. He added that if the tools and environment are not improved, Jamaica will not see an advancement. Even though we focus a lot on training persons and you know, uh, um, setting up people to deliver good customer service, what we have to understand, and, and this has come home to us, Camille, at NSWMA, is that many times we have excellent people in the, in the public sector but what happens is that the procurement rules and the processes, the environment that will put people to work in actually inhibits them from delivering that good customer service. It's not that they don't want to do it. Mr. Chung noted that the government has been trying to fix the problem for over 10 years, yet there is still no progress. Some of these places you're going to, just, just give the place a, a coat of paint. You know, so that people have a good environment to work, uh, work in. You know, you're asking people to come and sit down at a chair for eight hours, but yet still the chair is, is, is breaking down, right? These are some of the things that we need to address. We can't put people in a system and ask them to provide good customer service, but yet still we tie their hands and say, well, you know, we know that you want the best of the company, but you can't do this because we have this rule in place. Right? We have to give people the environment to work in. Motorists and residents in St. Elizabeth are concerned about the condition of a stretch of the main road that has been under construction for quite some time. As you hear in this report, it's also causing health problems for some residents. A section of the Goshen main road in St. Elizabeth. This is what it's like as you try to get through the area. Dusty. Depending on the speed of vehicles passing the area, it's often difficult to see and the drivers are frustrated. Lord God Almighty, man, it's sickening, man. It's sick to me, man. 
six to one. Dust, when I know dust and mud. When I know mud, bump up, Lord God Almighty, man. The rocks don't drive past. I'm gonna road that. The people say the dust is due to road repairs being done, which they say should have long been completed. And they say it's costing them. On the part is very expensive. And the man, they come like say, they might do, at the backyard, they might work. They know, in church, they know, and that way, they might do. If I volunteer, my volunteer appear, they might get to do their work. Because I, I, I think, to my, to my belief, that road is supposed to finish and close off a long time. So, man, every day, the man just come down, they just come park up, park up on that tree like they might fall. Every day, you have to wash it, yeah. Every day. From inside to outside. That's how the traffic is already, and I'm going to draw the work. <laughs> they might draw the work. But look at if people may come to them, then they want the dust, so they can't get money half of the dust. <laughs> The dust along the roadway is also said to be causing health problems for some residents. The dust affects us a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. Sign us, take all my own lady, we have to take her to your hospital. And it's a full time, we need this thing to speed up and get ready and go in. The motorists want the matter addressed. Need to wet the road or fix the road or highly or put something on it, but you can't stay like that. And when they're ready, they just go through and not dig up. When they're ready, they not take the, the, the equipment they and just block the road. When they're ready, the road not do right. Krista Campbell, TVJ News. In news overseas, according to an Arab youth survey, more than half of the young Syrian refugees don't plan to return home permanently unless ISIS is eliminated and the war in their country comes to an end. We go to the CNN for more. Just three months ago, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley, said uh, the quote was, in no way do we see peace in that area with Assad at the head of the Syrian government. But is this the final acceptance, this decision that anti-Assad Syrian rebels are incapable of defeating the regime? It has been evident for a long time uh, that Syrian rebels who have been fighting the Assad government with American support have not been making progress, have been losing ground, in fact, uh, and that Assad has largely won the Syrian civil war and that he will remain in power. Mr. Putin has long wanted the US to do, well, precisely this. And, and to be fair uh, to Donald Trump, he, he campaigned on this, on doing this. He campaigned on uh, saying that he would back away from this. But is Mr. Putin the winner here? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the biggest winner is uh, Bashar al-Assad and the Syrian government itself as an ally to Bashar al-Assad. The Russian government uh, is also a winner, but so is the Iranian government. But I think it's also just an acceptance of a reality that the Syrian rebels backed by the United States were not making progress on the ground. We could talk about why, but that's the grim reality. And in sports, the World Para-Athletics Junior Championships got underway yesterday in Switzerland with an opening ceremony. Jamaica will be represented by five athletes. Jamaica's contingent of five athletes, Joshua Pinnock, Tavon Thomas, Jason Braun, Moisha Morris and Teandre Tavares, will be seeking to bring back glory to the shore. Of the five athletes, Pinnock, Morris and Tavares will be performing on the world stage for the first time in their para-athletics careers. Pinnock and Morris will be performing in F51 and F40 field events, while Tavares will compete in the club through F51 class. I'm looking at um, the best for them. They have been putting out the training. Well, basically, all three started very, very late. They, they have not given a maximum of, of two years in training, right? Which means that they, 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 Moisha, she has just reached basically one year in training. And um, the other two, Joshua and, and Teandre, they started um, later down in the year. So, you know, I'm looking, at, I'm looking for them to do um, exceptional, exceptional well. But despite the athlete's short time in the sport, president of the Jamaica Paralympic Association, Christopher Samuda, is looking towards big things from Tavares. I expect Evan to do well this. I expect him to get the goal. He, will, he narrowly missed the goal at the Parapan Junior Games in Sao Paulo. Um, he's well prepared, he's focused, and I think he's very hungry for that gold medal. And if he remains steadfast in his um, will, he certainly will get that gold. But Samuda warns there is no quick success when it comes to Paralympics. You have to dedicate yourself and sometimes success doesn't come until three, four years, five years afterwards. Um, and this is what we are trying to instill in our athletes and instill in persons who come into the association. Success is not overnight. You have to build the necessary will, you have to build the necessary capital, you have to build the necessary um, commitment. 
and ensure that you stick to it over the years. And Competition starts on Thursday and ends on the 6th of August. And that's the Midday News. I'm Andrea Chisholm. Join us at 7 for Primetime News. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.